Today we're talking pedestrian life, arts in Charlotte, and the future of WTVI. I'm Carlton Hargrove and this is 282. for tuning in to another episode of 282. As always, we'll be exploring some of the hottest local current events with some of the city's brightest minds. And But before you meet those brightest minds that I mentioned before, I want to say what's up to another bright mind, 282 producer Jarvis Holiday, who's over in what I'm calling today the holodeck, which is a Star Trek reference. Star Trek. Don't you know, Carlton, it's all about Hunger Games right now. Oh, man. yeah, I know, man. I'm sorry about Mexico that. will need a Hunger Games reference. We can do a Hunger Games battle at okay. the end of the show. <laughs> all right. I want to uh, say what's up to the folks watching us on the live stream. And you all can follow the show on Twitter, at 282TV. If you want to comment on some of the topics our panelists are discussing, use hashtag 282TV, and we're incorporated into the show. Cool, cool. And I know for a fact that we already have some stuff coming in for one of our guests. Who you will meet right now. Let's meet the, the bright minds that we have. First up, let's say hello to Mary Newsom, who's a longtime journalist and now is the Associate Director of the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute, right? That's right. Thanks. Wonderful. All right. Up next, we have Manoj Kesevan, who is a longtime arts activist, architect, and also the founder of a new project called Chaos. What's up, Manoj? And we've also got Chris William, who is with Wells Fargo, but also is a longtime host of the show Carolina Business Review right here on WTVI, right? That's correct. Wonderful. Sets right over there. We're going to talk about the set today. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get right to the conversation. We're going to jump right in. We're going to start talking about pedestrian life. Now, we've actually talked about pedestrian life to a certain extent on this show. And we've talked about public transportation, things like that. And we know now that although most people get around via automobile, there's a lot of people that walk places now and bike places and and they have their own unique issues. And we kind of want to just delve into the, the idea of uh, the question, is pedestrian life in Charlotte good or bad? So what do you think? I think that depends on where you are and what you're comparing it to. Okay. Compared to Manhattan, it's pretty bad. Okay. If you're in certain parts of the city, if you're downtown, it's pretty good. The um, problem for most people is twofold. Uh, first is that the city was not built by and large with pedestrians in mind. Once you get outside of the, the neighborhoods of Dilworth, Elizabeth, um, Wesley Heights, the old streetcar suburbs. Mm -hmm. And when you add to that the problem that um, you have a lack of sidewalks and you have a lack of awareness on the part of both drivers and pedestrians okay. about how to do, how to walk safely. Let me jump in real quick. I do want to make sure that we're clarifying. We talk about pedestrian life, uh, at least as you know, with as far as you're concerned. Um, are we talking just about people that are walking or people that are riding bikes? So what exactly are we focusing on here? I'm going to talk primarily about people who are walking. Okay. But a lot of the techniques that a city will use to make life safer and more comfortable for pedestrians translate just as well into bicycling. Okay. So, but your point, the, what you're saying is that depending on what part of town you live in, you could have a better walking experience or bike riding experience than others. Yes, that's exactly So right. what are some bad neighborhoods that you don't really see a lot of walking in or... Well, how much time do we well, have? Well, I mean, just give me a few choice ones. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about some of the places where there have been some fatalities right, in recent right. yeah, that's true. last couple of months. There was that horrible accident on West Highwall Road uh, where two young kids were killed. They were walking with their father on a stretch of the road that doesn't have a sidewalk. Okay. And a truck apparently swerved off and hit them, killed the two little boys. Mm -hmm. That's a piece that's in West Charlotte. It's just south. If you're on West, if you're on West Boulevard and you turn left down onto Tywala Road, okay, it's right down in there. It's very near a couple of schools. Right. The second fatality was on Eastway at Geringer High School. A student was trying to cross the street there and was hit by someone. Okay. Just a, last week, a student was badly injured outside of Butler High School, down outside the city of Charlotte, in but still in Mecklenburg County, very near Highway 51. Okay. Um, there was a Central Piedmont student um, killed down on South Tryon Street, way down on South Tryon Street. Um, and all these accidents, were they due to not having sidewalks? No, they were not. Um, oh, they weren't? Okay. No, that they, they was just one of the points that I want to make. Okay. You can still you can have a sidewalk and still have a very unsafe pedestrian 
experience. So what makes it unsafe if you have sidewalks? What then makes it? Well, you can't get across the street is one problem. There's no pedestrian crosswalk in okay. front of Geringer. And in fact, I've timed this with my car. You can go from, there's a crosswalk at Shamrock and a crosswalk at Plaza, the Plaza. And that is a full mile between those two. Wow. And Geringer is right in the middle of it. It's a funky intersection. There's, there is a stoplight, um, but it's getting across those lanes of traffic is very difficult. You've, mm -hmm. got a, you've got cars coming in from Sugar Creek. They don't have stoplight. They can just merge directly onto Eastway. Right. Well, let me, I'm going to delve, we're going to get deeper into this, but I do want to kind of throw it around to the other guests and just kind of get your sense from Charlottean. You know, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts about the safety of pedestrian life? I mean, from your perspective, Manoj? Well, you know, ha having lived in, well, this is the 10th city I'm living in, so. That's it? 10? No, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I, I, I got tired. <laughs> 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 well, you know, um, pedestrian, it's, you know, it's, this is not a pedestrian or bike-friendly city. Mm -hmm. And I think the general problem, I think the bigger problem is it's also all the planning, you know, I mean, whether it's urban planning or, or pedestrian planning or vehicle or planning, it's all so, you know, looking at a map from above, you know, it's, there isn't any uh you know, view from the ground up. Okay. So it makes sense in the, you know, in the big sense, I guess, but it's just not human friendly. It's not very, it's kind of a dehumanizing kind of system. Hmm. Okay. So it's bad for pedestrians, but Charlotte is not that great a, a place for, you know, um, if you have a car either. Oh boy. Okay. It's, All it's, right. it's, it's just a. That's another can of worms. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> well, Chris, what, what, let me get your thoughts before I go back to Mary on just your feelings about the safety of pedestrian life. You know, I, I, sitting here listening to Mary, um, thinking about, gosh, I wonder what cities do do it well. Right. Um, it almost seems like an ad hoc system that we have. I, I know what, if, I, if I'm riding a bike or I'm running uh, on the roads uh, or on the street, you have to be, you, you have to be hyper vigilant. And it almost feels like uh, you've got to be uh, defensive when right. you're out there and, yeah. and, 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 you know, uh, paying attention to things. So I guess I'd, I'd just ask Mary, well, is, a, yeah, is there a question. larger plan? Um, there is, at this point, no larger plan. Well, I brought a show and tell. Um, this is the 2008 draft of the City of Charlotte pedestrian plan. It's never been finished. It's never been adopted because they haven't finished it. So why haven't, why haven't they finished it? I think there's uh, several reasons. One is that the, the Charlotte Department of Transportation wanted to concentrate on what's called the Urban Street Design Guidelines, which they did get passed. And that has a lot of standards in it for how to build sidewalks in new areas. Mm -hmm. And the city is applying those in the transit station areas. Mm -hmm. so, so to the extent they have a plan, it's kind of through the back door. It's through their transit station area plans. Okay. So going forward, they've got some pretty good ideas for how to build it. But they don't have anything in there for things such as how, how long is it between signalized intersections? This is a um, this is a map. I don't know if you can see it, of the distances between signalized intersections. If you're trying to take the bus, and you are on one side of Eastway and you want to get to the other side of Eastway, you either have to walk a mile out of your way, which is 20 minutes one way and 20 minutes back, mm -hmm. or you cross just kind of running across the street Busy through the street. traffic. Yeah. Yeah. I drive to work that way every day. I see people out there every day on Eastway, on North Tryon Street, sprinting across major wow. roads. Yeah. It's, it's a miracle more people haven't been killed. The, so it's not just sidewalks. Right. It's having lights. It's having lights that work. It's having people understand that pedestrians in the crosswalk have the right of way. I, I mm. walk to work sometimes, mm -hmm. and you have to be hyper-vigilant. Mm, I have yeah. pounded on people's pounded on the hoods of their cars. Like, I'm, walking I'm, I'm walking here. I'm walking, walking here. here. Yeah. Well, let me let me jump to Jarvis really quick. I think he's got something from Twitter. Yes, we asked our followers on Twitter if they thought Charlotte was a pedestrian-friendly city. At Leela underscore Allen says, for PM, I'm assuming it means Plaza Midwood, and Elizabeth residents, the gold rush is, is an awesome but still not well-known resource for getting uptown. Free to exclamation point. At Smedet says, no, I don't think so. Lack of sidewalks, bike lanes, awareness from pedestrians and drivers. I don't feel safe as a pedestrian or a cyclist. At Matt C. Hershey says, he believes 
we've made improvements by leaps and bounds in the past decade, but still have a long way to go. No short answer. Or short answer, no. And one more, um, at Matt Cosper says that Charlotte certainly is not bike friendly and the sprawl sure doesn't encourage a pedestrian lifestyle. Well, thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, uh, Twitter folks. Mary, I want to ask you another question. In terms of planning, are bikes looked at the same way as cars or are bikes looked at as kind of people? Like, um, do you turn yourself into a vehicle once you get on it? When you get on a bike, you're a vehicle. Okay. And you have every right to the traffic lanes that an automobile has. Okay. Legally, you are a vehicle, and transportation planners are supposed to view you that way. Now, in the real world, we all know that if the car and the bicycle have an encounter, mm -hmm. one of them is going to drive away, and the other one is going to be mauled on the pavement. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a realism piece that comes into it. And there's also some... PR or marketing, if you will, bicyclists that take a whole lane of traffic can really tick off motorists. Right, right. Yes, they have the right to be there, and they will say, what's your problem? But you do end up with some hostility building up over time. So the, I, I did want to say the pedestrians in Charlotte, in Charlotte, actually, bicyclists have had much better advocacy over the last 15 years. You, you know, it, it, can I just say oh, yeah. just a couple of observations here? Certainly not as an expert. Mary, but as, as someone that does take advantage of the pedestrian and the greenways and the things we have here, there's two things that I've noticed, and that is the bikes have had, it seemed to have learned um, through blood mm -hmm. how to be respected and how to respect in traffic. Right. But, and I would say any of us can drive down any road, and, and it happened to me this weekend. I'm driving down the road, and there's a pedestrian standing right on the double yellow line and crossing, not at a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder... Um, and I'm certainly not referring to any of the fatalities, but I do wonder how many times uh, pedestrians, unlike bicycles, don't have, and I'm not talking about formal training, but I wonder how much common sense comes into this where you just don't stand in the middle of the road. Right, right, yeah. Uh, so I, I guess, can you change that? I don't know that you can. I, I don't know. Mary, what do you think? There are ways to change that. Part of it you do through um, education. I mean, do kids in school learn safe pedestrian techniques? I don't think so. My, my daughter certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. Do drivers in driver training learn how to look out for pedestrians? If they do, they certainly forget it. And the other piece of it is you can design your streets differently. And mm -hmm. speed limit is a huge factor. Uh, if you hit someone going 45 miles an hour, that person is almost certainly dead. Right. If you hit someone going 15 miles an hour, that person will almost certainly survive. The difference between 25 miles an hour and 40 miles an hour is huge in terms of survivability. So part of what you want to do inside a city is figure out how to turn your streets into streets where drivers will instinctively go more slowly. That's okay. a huge safety technique. Well, Mary, yeah. uh, and I know we could talk about this. I know there are many more issues around this and things I want to ask, but we got to move on to another topic. So uh, I want to actually start talking about arts in Charlotte. And Manoj, I know that's like an area where you're pretty much an expert in, even though you would disagree, I know. <laughs> but uh, there's lots of stuff going on, although, you know, that's the big question. You know, we had uh, the music editor from Creative Loafing, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Hain, here last week, and we talked about music in Charlotte. Right. And we were, you know, basically trying to decide whether Charlotte has kind of emerged from being a B music market. And a lot of people kind of look down on the cultural scene in Charlotte and say there's not much going on. Mm -hmm. But I wonder... Do you feel like that is a misnomer? Is that a, a myth now? Are we emerging as a cultural uh, de destination? Well, uh, you know, f first of all, you know, I'm, I, I'm not an expert, and also yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and unlike a, a you know, like a music editor or a cultural editor who is more of you know they are the weather weather people, mm -hmm. I'm more of a climatologist. Mm -hmm. I just you know I just kind of follow the bigger trends okay. just by in the, being in the middle of all that. Uh, I think the first thing we need to, I, I think the first indicator of Charlotte emerging as an art destination or a happening place for art and culture would be when we stop comparing others ourselves with other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's, it really shows kind of that, you know, kind of adolescent uh, inferiority complex. Right. So we're always trying to trying to be world class, whatever that means, you know. So we're you feel like we're still trying to 
you know, I know at one point they were going to cities like Austin and kind of looking at their scene. Are right. we still doing it? Well, and also, I mean, it's a question of who is doing it. Okay. I mean, there is there is the city officials or chamber of commerce. I don't know who, who I don't know where these things come from, and which is you know plus the media who who's obsessed about these things. Right. I don't think the people who are actually creating art or you know the designers. They don't wake up every day thinking, how am I comparing to New York? I mean, they just do their work. So in that sense, I think there is so much of talent here. Uh, it's just that it's the way it's being discussed and it's the way it's being perceived, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, so. is it is it, you know, from the artist's perspective, I mean, mm -hmm. you know a lot of artists, do you get the sense that they can, are at a point where they can sort of make a living doing this now? Or or is it they have to, is not too many people making a living doing the arts in Charlotte? Well, again, it, it's a you know, it's a very broad spectrum of uh, professions when you just talk about art. So there is a huge number of people making a living doing art, whether mm -hmm. it's you know, I mean, I mean, my background is architecture, so you know, there's in, involves a whole bunch of design, graphic design, and you know, designers, musicians, uh, painters, sculptors. I mean, so, so I think you know, yeah, there, yes, there are, there are a lot of people making. A, living doing art and okay. again I don't know how we can compare that and how how good an indicator that is oh okay the other thing is you know it's not just how much money you make which draws an artist to a city or you know wants them to stay there there's a lot more other things you know how, how good is how strong a community is there how well they are recognized by others mm -hmm. by the media and those are things which we could work on right now okay it doesn't doesn't require a big influx of funding or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It is something we all could do ourselves, and okay. which is what we tend to focus on. Okay. Now, in one second, I'm going to ask you about uh, chaos, but okay. I do want to get a sense from Mary and Chris. I mean, you guys have been in Charlotte for a while, and what do you think about the the art scene? Have you seen it grow? Are you happy with it, or is this something that you think we need more of? Oh, I think yes and yes and yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Next, Chris. No. Uh, whatever <laughs> Mary said, I'm going to go with Mary on it's all this. It's grown dramatically. But, okay. Um, but is it where it ought to be? No. And yeah. I have a question for Manoj. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your thoughts on whether arts and creativity are valued for their intrinsic value here or whether they're valued because they're good for business. Well, well which again, by, valued by whom? That's a question. By the civic um, infrastructure. Which means? Whatever you <laughs> want it to be. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, th that's a problem. You know, I, I think we tend to rush to this very abstract mm -hmm. and vague kind of notions about like being world mm -hmm. class or, be, I mean, and I don't usually deal with those such big questions mm -hmm. for, you know, and for most of us kind of in the front lines of art, it is about what you can get to do here, you know, because that's our lives, you know. How creative can you be? How productive can you mm -hmm. be? So in that sense, you know, no, this is not still not an ideal place. You know, there is no audience for a certain kind of art. You know, right. And and also, I think it's uh, I don't think it's just a problem problem of Charlotte alone. All of let's say secondary cities like this, we all have this attitude that life is elsewhere. So if you want to see something really cool or edgy, you have to look to New York or you know L.A. or right. some other place like that. So we tend to undervalue what we all have around here. Well, let me ask you this, Manoj, and then uh, this is actually the last question for this topic, and we're going to move on, but uh, tell us about chaos and the role that plays in, in the art scene. Well, uh, chaos is it's spelled Q-U-E-O-S. It's a Q as in, you know, as in okay. question, query, O-S as in open studio. Man, so this, is, this is heavy. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, as you know, I know I've, over the years I've been doing the Point Date Forum, the Pecha Kucha Nights, and I was involved in TEDx Charlotte. So we've been creating this kind of, you know, rather successful venues, if I may say so myself, mm -hmm. for, you know, people from different fields, creative people, uh, to come together, share their ideas. And we also built a pretty large audience for that. So what Chaos tries to do is take it to the next level, create the space where all these people can create something together instead of just talk about it. Okay. So it's this big collaborative studio that we are setting up. Cool. And we are currently based at the McCall Center for Visual Art. They have provided us a space, so the studio has been launched oh, cool. there. All so. right. Well, look, um, I know we're going to put out where people can find out more more information sure. about that. So, but uh, so you know, I'm sure people might even hit you up via this show. We have a lot 
of yeah. fans, you know what I mean? Especially me. But <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on. We don't have enough time for these topics, but I, I do want to talk. We want to get to WTVI, and we want to talk to you, Chris, uh, kind of being the point person on this topic. Uh, well, it's important to know that I'm not the point person for WTVI. Okay, I mean, well, I, I'm just I mean, just here yeah. right today, you know. Yeah. Um, just give us an idea about, I know we've seen it in the news, we've seen uh, all these stories in the Observer, and I know recently, uh, last week, it was announced that there's going to be a merger with CPCC, but, you know, I think maybe the average viewer doesn't really know what's going on with WTVI, and I wonder, can you kind of just fill in some of that information for folks? Well, uh, just, you know, quickly. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Um, okay. Uh, what What is going to happen, as I understand it, is uh, uh, WTVI will become, uh, as we use in the corporate world, a wholly owned part, wholly owned subsidiary of, of CPCC. Uh, uh, it seems like a wonderful marriage. I know WTVI is excited. CPCC is excited. And quite frankly, when you look at this, you, you have to wonder, gosh, why wasn't this done before? What right. a great idea. Um, I, 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 personally, I look at this and think, gosh, having all, you know, we talk about arts, Minoj, and, mm -hmm. you, and you can't talk about arts without having creativity mixed in there. Mm -hmm. And when you have students and you have educators and you have TV and social media all coming together, it would seem like it's the perfect marriage, and, and it certainly would seem that way. So that's kind of didn't answer your question completely, but kind of got you to that point. So, But this means for your average viewer out there who watches WTVI that the station will continue to exist and flourish, and yes. they'll be able to turn on WTVI and see programming it, it like, they're, yeah. like always. Carlton, absolutely, it okay. will. It, 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 it means a lot of support for an organization, WTVI specifically, that needed that kind of that backbone and that underpinning that they have not had because of a thousand different things. But yes, it will mean that uh, at least for a long time, WTVI will be uh, much greater than the sum of, of just the two. That's cool. Now, one thing I want to ask you, just sort of a kind of opinion-based question around the issue, you know, uh, public television and even stuff like NBR, like anything that's funded uh, by the people and mm -hmm. government and grants, uh, has been getting a lot of criticism lately. It's kind of become a politicized issue to a certain extent. And I, I don't know if you, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that public tele, PBS and NPR and things like that have become sort of these hot politicized mm -hmm. topics? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I was listening to Mary and Minoj and you talk about arts, and I was thinking, you know, it's, it's Carlton, it's, the, the arts are so hard to define, but gosh, you sure know a nice piece of art when you see it, but right. you can't really articulate it. And that, that's kind of what public broadcasting is. And, and personally, and let me point a personal preference here, when we started Carolina Business Review 20 years ago now, and it's just hard to believe uh, that it's been 20 years, we wanted to go to a place that was the honorable place on the dial, um, that was the place for non-inflammatory dialogue, that was the place that intelligent people could uh, respectfully disagree. Mm -hmm. And we found that PBS was the place, and we found that WTVI in Charlotte. We are also seen on UNC TV and ETV in South Carolina. Uh, but uh, th those three PBS affiliates are partners, but they were, they were kind of the landing place for, um, uh, in, a, in commercial broadcasting, it's, it, it's kind of an oasis that's not motivated by money. It's motivated by mission. Right. So I think the whole reason it's under attack is because it's hard to articulate, a mm -hmm. lot like art. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to make your case on why, by the numbers, uh, is an old, at least in the old business model, why it should be around. And I think we're redefining that now. Right. Well, let me throw this out to Mary and Manoj. Do you feel like, I mean, you know, really the same question. Why do you feel like uh, PBS has become sort of this politically charged, you know, entity? Well, any, anything from which there is political capital to be made, I guess, would become that. So okay. It's what do you mean when you say uh, capital to be made? Well, in the sense that, you know, by, by attacking something a, as something which is, you know, representing something else. Right. So, you know, it, it becomes a political tool. So. I think know. there's two yeah. different reasons. One is, and one is very, is tied to what you were saying. I right. think that there are some networks that, that make their money off of attacking mm -hmm. all the other networks as being quote unquote liberal. Um, so you're going to hear that because it's uh, probably in their business plan mm -hmm. to attack everything else as being untrue and liberal. There's also a philosophy, I think, about what is the proper role of government. Mm -hmm. 
And and to me, that's something where reasonable people are going to disagree. Right. But and once you let the government's nose under the tent, so to speak, you have married yourself to something that may or may not be what you want. And I think the same issue arises with public funding of the arts, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you know if you're an artist, you need public funding, but maybe you don't need to hear politicians complaining about what you've done. Right. There's there's two sides to that story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well that, Chris, yeah. um, well, you had no, some... no, that, no. That's a great point, actually, because you know, pub public funding for art is something we talk about a lot in our circles. And the traditional way of funding, like you know, that patronage model, where you know, which has mostly been followed here too, like you know, art and science council kind of entities collect a lot of money, they fund organizations, uh, I mean, and individual artists. That kind of thing it's weakened a lot in the recent years, mm -hmm. basically due to the economy. But I would like to think that that model is just not working mm -hmm. anymore. Right. So what is you know how can we still we still keep doing, you know, public art or any kind of art at a large scale? Without that kind of traditional funding, so but you know in the art world people are getting more creative, you know like our entity Chaos here, you know, which is again a group of artists coming together and taking the lead on doing big stuff. Do, right. do I have time to so, add one more thing? Right. Yeah, totally. Sorry, totally. So, so, so you know, I mean, I, I don't know what the equivalent in the media would be, yeah. but you know, but I think there is the, the there needs to be an acceptance that the traditional models might not work anymore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, well, and you've got to, and I hope we don't run out of time here, but, and, and you've got to think about this, you know, so many times we try to make arguments based on, on finance, and I, I, you know, been at one of the major banks, I understand finance, I know how that works, but we can't articulate everything, and yeah, everything can't right. be argued by the numbers, and I think we have to force ourselves to think a little bit more abstractly about some parts of our life, certainly our public life, and then on top of that, you, you know, sometimes you just have to step out and say, what is the value of this really, not just by the numbers, and what is the value of art or what is the value of public broadcasting, and does it, is it really additive to right. the community? Right. And I, you, if you can answer that question, I think you get closer to feeling good about funding something or not. Okay. Well, hey, that's a great note to end on. And, I mean, it's good to know that, you know, WTVI will continue and that it has a bright future, you know, so we'll... I'd totally be keeping up with this subject, definitely. And if people have more information, I'm sure we'll put some some stuff there. Do we have something from Jarvis before we wrap up? Yeah, just a couple of quick uh, couple of quick tweets um, at on the WTVI subject and the merging with CPC and the funds from the city from the county. At daily underscore pinch, I love WTVI and I'm so thankful plans are in the works to keep the station going. But on the other side of the spectrum, at KDS Trout. Uh, sarcastic comment here. No biggie, just more of your money on a failed business model with WTVA, WTVI model. It's just money, people. Well, that's not nice now, is it? No, but uh, no, we're very, we're very happy that WTVI is continuing, not just because we're on the station either. I mean, it's uh, PBS, you know, I grew up watching PBS uh, as a kid in Gary, Indiana. I watched the Channel 11 in Chicago, uh, WTTW. And, you know, before there was cable, this thing opened my mind to everything. I'm a kid growing up in a terrible neighborhood watching, you know, really great program from all over the world. So we got to have it. Anyway, thank you folks for joining us. Thank you guys for being on the panel. Wish we had more time to talk about all this. Uh, thank you. Come back next week. When we'll have another show, another great panel of guests, more stuff from the holodeck too. See you next week.